Hi guys, I feel really special. Um, but I want to start off uh, by asking you a question. And what if, the fa what if your favorite person in the entire world told you that they might die? It's not a fun question, but this actually happened to me once. It was a Wednesday and I was sitting in my bedroom just doing my English homework, something normal. And my mom walked in and she shut the door behind her. And I knew, I knew this meant trouble. And she put her hand on my shoulder and said, Priyanka, it's cancer. And I'm gonna do my best to fight it. But if not, I gave you everything I had, right? My mom is a really strong person. And I think she knew in that moment that if she had cried, if she had crumbled, that I would feel crushed. But I was really, really lost. I felt like this Jenga tower of emotion. If one piece that was holding me together was pulled out from underneath me, I would undoubtedly topple over. Until I did, and it was a Thursday. And I sat at a doctor's office, not too far from here, and explained to him the way I'd been feeling for the past two and a half years. I was tired. I didn't want to get out of bed. I was constantly nervous and panicked about life. It scared me. It, it made me fearful. And he said to me, Priyanka, you know, it's obvious. You, you struggle with anxiety and you struggle with depression. And I'm going to need you to get on this medication immediately because I, I want you to feel better. And I walked out of his office with a prescription and a broken heart. Like so many of us who come to college and find that our circumstances are so different than they were when we were in high school, it can be heartbreaking. We just want to be those happy kids that we were back in high school. And that's not to say that we're not those happy kids in college. But when things turned out differently than planned, it's hard. But I went home that summer and I was determined to do something about my illness. I had watched my mom battle through cancer. And I thought, wow, if she could get through that, I can get through this and I'm gonna be all right. So I went back to the desk where my mom first told me the bad news on that Wednesday. And I hoped to find some inspiration, but I couldn't find any. And so I decided, you know, let me go out for a walk. Let me go around the neighborhood and see what I find. You always find inspiration in the strangest places. And a lot of you might notice that. And I was watching the garbage men, just the way they were doing what they do every single day, you know, bagging up the trash and then throwing it out and doing it at the next person's house and the next person's house. But it was really poetic for me. I thought, wow, what if I could take all the trash from my life, oops, that has been accumulating over the past 20 years and, and throw it away and start to get rid of it. Imagine if I just kept that trash there my whole life. How much would it stink? So I went back into my desk and I wrote, take out the trash. Priyanka, that's what you have to do. You have to take out the trash from your life. So a few weeks later, I was looking through my bookshelf and I buried this book away like four or five months ago. Someone gave it to me and it was about mindfulness. And I was like, what is this? stuff, like this hippie stuff, like mindfulness, like what is this going to do for me? Like it's probably not going to make me feel any better until I actually looked at what it taught. And it teaches us about living in the moment. And you're here right now living in the moment. And that's so powerful. And I, I never lived in the moment before. I feel like I looked at my whole life and my whole life I was living in the past or the future. So mindfulness immediately soothed some of my symptoms of anxiety and depression. But by far the coolest method that I learned had to deal with renaming. It talked about taking a problem that you have in your life that's really painful, like my mom's cancer, for example, and giving it a funny name so you might laugh at it once in a while. And I knew anxiety and depression were gonna be close friends of mine for a while, and I wanted to love them. I wanted to love them like they were my best friend showing up at my door after six months. And I thought of somebody who I knew that really loved something, and like a true 90s kid, I stumbled upon Kel. If any of you have seen Keaton and Kel, this guy sits there for half the show talking about how much he loves orange soda, and he's a millionaire. So I figured he's got something going for him. And I renamed my anxiety and depression in that moment when I stumbled upon Kel that night on my couch watching TV. And I just renamed my anxiety orange soda. That was it. And when I would journal about it, I would start to laugh. And I would talk to myself about it in my head, and I would start cracking up. And these words that had such power over me were no longer so serious anymore. They were funny. I could laugh again. And that was one simple thing that mindfulness taught me. Now, the second step that I took to taking out the trash from my life 
happen in a much more interesting way, I would say. This is my eight-year-old dog, Arthur, sitting on my computer. And I've always thought of Arthur as this miniature Buddha covered in hair, a line that Ron Burgundy did steal from me, actually. If you ask him, he'll tell you. Um, and he always inspires me in the strangest ways. And I was wondering why he was doing this, until I realized that before I go to bed every night, I usually pollute my mind with images of happy people on Facebook. Does anybody else do this in the audience? I think yes, the overwhelming answer is absolutely. We look at that one person who has everything going for them. They post pictures of their new job, their GPA, their new crush, and their life seems perfect. And you start to look at your own life and you're like, wow, what am I doing wrong? And you really, you know, it really sets up this unreality for us that happiness is the only acceptable emotion. And that's not true, and that's not okay, and that's not a message that we can send to members of our own generation and the generations below us. And I realized that there was a connection between this scrolling, this looking through my newsfeed and the way I was feeling. And then I realized, in 2013, a study done by the New York Daily News said that 75% of college students in 2013 reported feeling overwhelming anxiety and one third of them reported feeling so depressed that it was difficult for them to function. And I couldn't th help but think that this was a huge correlation. I felt like I had just figured it out. And once I was able to spend less time on social media, I could connect with myself. I could live in the moment and I could enjoy my life here and now. And that was so powerful for me. And that was the second step that I took at taking out the trash. Now the third step that I took was by far the most powerful. And that step is such an underrated step, and that step is called forgiveness. I would look back into my life and looked at the people who had really, really hurt me, who had said mean things to me, who had called me names, and I couldn't help but get so upset by it. Until this instance actually met me in my face when I was waitressing over the summer, and the bully who had tormented me for 10 years of my life walked in. And of course, I had to seed him, I was his waitress, I had to give him his menu, just the way the universe works. And I was like, this can't be true, you know? And I was so angry, I wanted to mess up his order so badly, and I wanted to tell him that everything that he wanted on the menu for some strange reason wasn't available today. Um, but I knew that I didn't want to give him the power to affect my life right now, I mean, I was 20 years old. And this had happened in elementary school, I wanted to move past it. So I forgave him in that moment for all the times that he'd hurt me, for all the times that he'd humiliated me. And after I forgave him, I forgave myself for not being perfect, for making mistakes, for not defending myself. And that was the most impactful moment of my life to date. And it was crazy. It just happened at a small restaurant in New Jersey. So there it was, the three steps I took to taking out the trash from my life. And I couldn't help but find the parallels between my journey and my mom's. When I was able to laugh at what Kel had taught me from all that, or Keenan and Kel, it reminded me a lot of how my mom laughed when they shaved her head as clumps of her hair was falling out during chemotherapy. My ability to stop comparing myself to others reminded me of how my mom decided one day that she wasn't gonna look at all the healthy people in her life and feel sad that she couldn't be one of them right now. And by the way, she is one of those healthy people now. She's fully recovered, which is amazing, which is amazing. And third, the step of forgiveness. I had watched my mom, my mom constantly forgive people in her life. And that really brought me such a source of inspiration. And if I could grow up to be one-fourth of the person that she is, I'll be blessed. And I hope that one day, if my life is ever put into question when I have kids of my own, that I can go to bed at night after taking care of them all day and made sure they were all right and say to myself, wow, today wasn't easy, but I gave it everything I had, right? Thank you very much. Appreciate it.